and we are live. Welcome, Rich. How you doing, man? I'm doing well, Tom. How are you, sir? It going great. Uh, this is a follow up, if you will. Rich just finished an amazing series that I watched all of. Uh, thank you, thank you. Especially the Nutanix one. We'll get to that in a moment here, because that one that one was surprising. I didn't realize how that worked. Uh, but Rich did a whole series on all the different alternatives compared to your background in VMware. You covered Proxbox, XCPNG, Nutanix, Hyper-V, which uh, I don't think anyone, I mean, there's at least a few videos you'll find, but I don't think anyone else uh, did Hyper-V. So that was, thank you for doing yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it was an interesting, I mean, the Hyper-V was probably one of the more interesting experiences just from the fact that I strongly don't like Hyper-V. I think in the beginning of that video, I was even like, hey, I got to lay my cards on the table here. I am not a fan of this software. Um, and, you know, there's there's redeeming qualities to all of them, and but some less than others. I was surprised to see the amount of, like, upset Hyper-V people that I made. You know, it's, yeah. Which is, you know, that was good. But so learn that was a, a fun experience. Um, the Nutanix one I, it was, I think, the last in your series. And by the way, that series is linked in the playlist down below. Uh, so you can watch all of them, including a talk me. And you did just in general about open source Absolutely. hypervisors. One of the things about the Nutanix one that really stood out, and all these have nice little screenshots back and forth. So you, you don't just talk about the product. You actually give us a demonstration of how it works. You took the time mm -hmm. to set these up and play with them. Uh, but the Nutanix one, so people can know right away, because I think this will knock it off that list. One, no pass through. Two, right. um, hyper converge or die. That's it. That's the only option you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I found kind of interesting. And uh, I brought this up to the 45 drives people. I did a live stream with them yesterday. We we're talking about Proxmox and XCPNG. And I was like, yeah, they're not friendly to 45 drives. They don't support anything but their own hardware. Like there's no uh, using a storage server. And 45 drive goes, well, they're no friend of ours. <laughs> you know, so. yeah. yeah, I was at a conference just a couple of weeks back and there were a bunch of storage vendors there. And I was having lots of conversations about you know, the future post VMware with a lot of these guys. And, you know, a lot of them have strong opinions about what's what they think is going to be the next big replacement for VMware. But at the time, none of them mentioned Nutanix at all. And I, I didn't bring it up to them because at that point I hadn't gone deep and tried to figure out, you know, the ins and outs of Nutanix. It wasn't later. I'm like, oh, that's because they have no play here because there's literally no value in them trying to sell a shelf when, you know, you can't use the sand with it. So it was an eye opening experience for sure. Yeah. The, the other interesting thing, um, I, I thought this was a good, it was an opinion piece that was in a register. I didn't read all of it, but I got the headline and I think that they got, they did nail it on this one. They said, Hey, he said other large scale companies looking at what hot tan got away with and wondering how much they can get away with. Uh, mm. it, it wouldn't shock me if some of these other companies go, well, if we're popular and we're locked in, how much more can we raise things? This is not just about hypervisor. This is about, you know, your, your big iron that runs because the hypervisor is all going to connect somewhere like to all the switches and everything else. How much, how much will those companies go? Well, guess what? You're not switching out these Nessus switches. You're not moving away from all the Cisco gear. <laughs> right. Can we just add that much more to the license? <laughs> it does feel like we might be at the beginning of a major shift and change. I, I saw even in our my Discord, people were upset about the ESU changes that Microsoft's made for Windows 10, right? And the, the $60 per device for the first year, 120, and then it just keeps stepping up and up. Like it does feel like there is a realization in business that, hey, maybe we can put the screws to people and they don't have a choice because we've got these, not monopolies necessarily, but these really solid products, they have great products and not a whole lot of alternatives to switch from. Yeah, you know, we were um, one of the things I was pricing out because we we have so many people and, you know, my bias uh, fully disclosed is going to be towards XCPNG because this is something we're using. We're doing production systems with this. And uh, just before we started the live stream, I was even talking, we just built a bigger lab at, at our uh, company, CNWR, just for teaching more of our staff. We got 17 techs and we're training uh, more of them up on how to do these migrations, walking them through the process. Uh, we were, we have a bid we're submitting. Uh, I worked on the solutions design with this. Um, it's all, you know, nice high-end Cisco switches, which, wow, the licenses. I was like, oh, this is only 10,000. They're like, oh, Tom, that's not the, that, that it don't work for 10,000. That's just a switch. <laughs> and that's the, that's the metal box, sir. That, that's the box. There's a license they have to put on there. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's twenty seven thousand now. The license. I couldn't believe that. It's like once we added for every all the features they wanted because this is um, five. Well, 
just under 600 VMs. Uh, we're looking mm -hmm. at high density super micro servers uh, will be in the quote. I mean, this is a half million dollar quote. And then there's the labor on top to migrate all the VMs. And uh, we've already done this for some of the companies. We've been doing it for more and more bigger ones. Uh, this one, we're doing some of the lift, but it's common. Uh, these companies, they we some moved a while ago and they kind of have to because they said it our business model because they host and resell that service they wrote some custom software each mm -hmm. one has to run in its own instance and they said yeah vmware is not making it tenable we would have to pass that cost along to our clients at a substantially higher right. versus xcpng is a much more affordable uh choice for us and they it, one, it, one of the ones you reviewed and i think you'd like you'd said if you're coming from the vmware world that concept of how it works is kind of there Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you speaking of the, uh, those, uh, third party sellers of, of services, I sure you saw in the news about how in Europe, there's starting to be some rumblings about how this change in licensing for these, uh, companies from VMware is essentially put, would put them out of business. And so there's hope I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it, but there's hope that there'll be some investigations into whether their pricing is, is appropriate for resellers of, of systems, right? Yeah, I mean, because they're essentially, they're not a monopoly, but when you have only a couple of companies colluding, it's just, I believe the term is oligopy. You have this, this small yeah. company, uh, these small of them doing it, it's still, it's not like a company doing it, but if they collude and say, well, we're the only people that sell 100 gig switches, uh, you can choose from one of these three vendors. And we've all just sat down while we were playing golf together and decided this right. is how much we charge. <laughs> exactly yeah they're they're they might look like they're independent companies but they they all play at the same golf courses and they i mean everybody has yeah. back channel communication so you know oh, yeah. that they're talking about these changes yeah and there okay. and there's somebody in golf uh they all play so hot tans going hey you know what you know how i solve my my deficit i mean i just raised the prices it turns out <laughs> i'm still here yeah just do what he did right you just raise yep. prices and you make more money it's weird <laughs> yeah i can see him and michael dell on the golf oh, course oh yeah 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 Right. <laughs> um, Yeesh. let's bring it back to Hyper-V for a moment, because one of the things I want to point out and one of the reasons we kind of don't like Hyper-V as much, and I think you highlighted some of this, but the dependency it has on Windows, there was even a February 2024 update that specifically borked Hyper-V. Then in March, we had the domain controller problem that was causing a memory leak that also mm -hmm. affected hosts that run Hyper-V. I, I just don't believe Microsoft releases the most stable builds when it comes to their updates. And this becomes a problem. Some people will answer, well, don't update until several months. But if there's a security update, this falls out of my own compliance that I'm yeah. providing for my client. And even if we did isolate the base OS and things like that, that's still not the best way to do it. Um, it it's one of the reasons I think Hyper-V is just kind of out because for all its flaws with, you know, the pricing with VMware, updates from VMware don't break the VMs. It's typically right. Yeah, yeah typically it's not. I mean, there's it, and we're talking over years. There's very few times you can point to. I'll say the same for XCPNG. I'm less familiar with Proxmox. Uh, I do know there was when going version seven to eight, people had some networking issues in Proxmox. But Proxmox is just Debian underneath. So if you have a good understanding of Linux, uh, you can work through those networking issues that came with it yeah i you know that's always been the the crux of windows right is that um and with hyper v I've, i said in the video too like i always kind of felt like for microsoft hyper v was something that they did because they didn't want to be left behind during that era when virtualization or data center virtualization was becoming a thing and even when looking at how you manage it and the expectations between uh, using like system center um, SC VMM, for example, which is a beast into itself for practically the only reasonable way that a, a, an enterprise could manage it down to just the simple uh, virtual machine manager that they provide, which is just MMC. It just, it never felt like they gave it the love. I do think that there is potentially a use case for it for people who are Microsoft shops, Microsoft shops only, mind you. I think that that's a, that's a key one. Yeah. Um, but they're looking at at minimizing their on-premise and shifting to like Azure Stack HCI and you know getting their on-premise workloads because off to Azure because in the end I think that's basically where that stuff will end. Microsoft will eventually make it so that it's just a fluid way to transfer on-premise workloads into Azure and then you're paying for your consumption fees in Azure instead of doing it on-premise. Yeah, Hyper-V is the gateway drug to Azure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I remember a time when it wasn't that way, and boy, do I miss those times. Yeah, I, I don't predict. I mean, we know there's a long life cycle, so it's not a direct concern that Microsoft's going to drop support for Hyper-V. Sure. Sure. I think it's what support is until 2028, the current iterations. There's no, in, in all the research I did, there's no indication that Microsoft's going to stop using Hyper-V in or providing Hyper-V as part of the Windows Server OSs. It just seems that there's a lot of engineering efforts going on to kind of merge between the the high, you know, we'll call it multi-cloud or, you know, from your private cloud to Azure, but that integration in Azure is where they, they see the, the real benefit from. But the free Hyper-V version is done as of like server 2019, but it's, I think it's supported up until 2027, 20, yeah. uh, 2029, something like that. Yeah. And I, I love because there's a comment from a Microsoft employee. Uh, and I, I think I brought this up in one of my older videos uh, on, on this related topic that they said, we don't have the resources to put into supporting a free version. And I'm like, your company's worth how many trillion? You don't have the, re you don't have the desire. Well, this, this yeah, is, that's you, it. Yeah, you are sitting on cash on hand more than any other company, pretty much, besides maybe Apple. And oh, mm -hmm. ah, we can't, we can't afford to support it, man. It would just, it would bankrupt us. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. That that's all political decisions inside the the walls of yeah. Microsoft, right? And, sure. and being that it's closed source, and one of the reasons I put the word open source alternatives in here is the uh, the nice thing about open sourcing, go back to the XCPG and Proxmox, for example, the fact that they fully open source this. And Citrix is an example. For those that don't know the history, Zen Server is the first open source hypervisor, and it's part of the Linux Foundation. Zen, the, hyper, Zen, the hypervisor embedded in the kernel. Zen Server and some of the various renaming that Citrix did, Citrix Zen Server, as they may have called it. Citrix became essentially a steward of the project because it's like anything. It's not that you just need the hypervisor. You kind of need some tooling around it. So they mm -hmm. put together all the tooling around it. Uh, and they were not a great steward of that open source project. That's how we got XCPNG in 2017. Citrix made some really horrible decisions that really made the community quite angry. But this mm -hmm. is the beauty of open source. Well, provided there's enough community effort around something, you can fork that project, take all that source code and build it again and build it into the product that you want. And they've completely removed, th there's still the remnants of it in there. If you look, uh, some of the licensing stuff, but they're all blank. It's all the licenses are just unlimited because they took out all the artificial requirements that kept getting added in by the folks at Citrix. They just unwound all of that and have their own spin. So when you look at things like XCB Proxmox, they give me a little bit more confidence for a better future because of their open source nature versus like Nutanix, like I mentioned, uh, is proprietary. It's a publicly traded company. They're a company that is also, if you Google Nutanix for sale, I've commented, there's non-tech okay. Wall Street articles you'll find where the company has been trying to find new investors or perhaps a buyer. And mm -hmm. uh, that is how the rug gets pulled out to. This is what led to that with VMware, so. Yeah, and you're 100% right. Like in, in my personal feelings, I do, maybe this is partially my my wishes and wants for the world but i want to see the open source hypervisors succeed and not just succeed but also like just supersede the closed source stuff when it comes to virtualization because you know we with with zen with uh with kvm we certainly have great foundations already to build upon and it's really more about how these open source companies can build the best interface the best user experience the best um feature set that will then basically make the the big guys potentially like competitive at a minimum because i still think that there's a there's certainly a a big play and a big place for specific things like uh like the closed source stuff from vmware and I, i'll hand it to vmware and i'll hand it to nutanix they have really fantastic global support they're available all the time um you know we said it a bunch of times so far, but like my, my background's in VMware. I've been VCP certified for years. Like I never worry about what I'm getting from them. And when it comes to needing someone to answer the phone and take care of things. And I think that that's one thing that I really hope to see the open source guys really build up is that level of, of comfort and support that we can basically come and rely upon. And then that makes them a, a, a true competitor for the rest of the corporate stuff that's out there. And this is not unfamiliar territory because this is what Red Hat built their company on was, hey, the code's free. We're not free. Our labor's not free. The customization mm -hmm. you want done or the support you want isn't free. Um, I, I really 
I wish they would have sold to IBM. Uh, that's a different topic. <laughs> but the the Red Hat concept, I think, was a great proven business model. This is something that can be done. It can be done at scale. And I think we are starting to see that. And it's funny because I, I believe the risk factor that companies have to think about might be changing a bit because there's definitely this old school mentality. Many large corporate companies have open source is a risk to my business. Who's going to be responsible for it? Who do I point the finger at? But as we watch, and even in the security realm, we can't even tr we can't even attempt to keep up with how many Avanti vulnerabilities there are. Like I just oh noticed there's another one today. I'm like, yeah. do they, I mean, how many CVEs does this thing have just in 2024? Yeah. Uh, then combine the fact that the companies, especially the ones that are just going to be paying for the new VMware licensing, same thing. They're like, what the risk they just faced was a non-predictable base cost to their thing. So they now got the rug ripped out from under them. So mm -hmm. actually not using open source feels like a risk to your business to some extent. Like these companies have not been behaving well, if you could say <laughs> You know, either by lack of security updates on some side, mm -hmm. raising of prices randomly. And I really wonder what the future of VMware looks like because the layoffs didn't, I, I've, my understanding based on following people on Twitter was they laid off a lot of smart people and the engineering people that pushed that product forward. Uh, where does that leave it for any future development? Uh, or is it going to be the broken toy of the future with no one updating it? And once they're done, you know, the way these companies work, Broadcom, who's, a tech company is really a private equity company masquerading as a tech company. It's a, yeah. it's a write-off like, well, we raised prices. It suddenly got less popular because it wasn't a great product anymore. Uh, and then we did a circle and we moved it over here and we took a tax loss on, on the five year on it. We made our money. We squeezed the juice, throw, throw it away over here. <laughs> yeah. That's, I sure hope that doesn't end up being the case, but you know, if I think there's been a lot of hay made, but I mean, in the in the early days like we like when you and i had our conversation like in the early days i i tried to stay positive when the broadcom thing was announced and hope that you know this wouldn't be another computer associate it wouldn't be another semantic and friends i was wrong and i can admit that i'm a man i can admit when i make mistakes and so that was it i i was the the fool in that and so i I, it's again, hard to really separate my like emotional feelings towards this product that I've been using for a very, very long time. But yeah, we, we live in an era now with where if a corporation can come in and five X, eight X, 12 X, your costs for your licensing for something that is the foundation of your business, it starts to make that look less tenable and you start to look for alternatives. And maybe that's really where we'll see a big uprising from the open source stuff to really fill that hole. And I sure hope so. Yeah, because the, the risk has definitely been slapped in the face of many of these companies. They're going, how much more do we have? Why are we giving the IT department more money? What are we getting out of them? Oh, that's just a licensing fee. Yeah. <laughs> we, you know, and yeah, it, it doesn't look good. Um, did you decide, and we can ask this, and by the way, there's about 300 people in the live stream right now. Uh, that's awesome. If, if you have some questions, uh, go ahead and throw them, throw them in the questions. We, we're here to take, it does say live Q&A here. Uh, yep. But did you decide what you want to use in your lab? So, we'll, oh my gosh. So, um, <laughs> not yet. I okay. hate to say it, but, uh, right. I just bought some brand new hardware. Um, oh, and cool. cause I, well, so at home right now, um, for those who don't know me and the stuff that I'm doing, I have a two node, uh, vSAN cluster. Yes. I know two node is a waste of, of resources. You can, you can tell me how bad I am in the comments. And I mean, I, I do, I am moving away from VMware for a variety of reasons, notwithstanding, but um, as, as, as my primary uh, virtualization platform, I bought a four node uh, SMC box with that are gen one, gen two scalables. Cause I really want to experience um, XCPNG, Proxmox, and even Nutanix at their full uh, clustered hyper-converged um, approach just to, uh, get a really good feel for it because you know you can do these videos and I all the videos were basically a single host like I, I didn't I didn't have the resources to build up a cluster really throw this as a cluster that's why the whole focus was from ESXi in in the sense of a singular hypervisor yeah. and really kind of want to know where the the true strengths comparison wise for at least for myself and professionally uh, lie within those products when you have four nodes right or three or four nodes to, to run again so that's that's my plan and after that point then for me at least there shall be a winner whatever that i mean i i personally lean more towards 
the XCPNG side for a lot of reasons. Like the big one is, is it feels more like what I'm comfortable with, where I came from. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the major changes that Vates is making to the user experience because that's one of my least favorite parts of it. But, um, but also, you know, I've, I've heard things about the way that Proxmox and the reliability of, of Ceph and stuff like that. And so I'm, I'm interested to see if that's one guy's bad story or if it's really, you know, the desync issues and failures are, are real. So there's a lot that I want to I want to figure out for myself. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to those options here. Yeah, I, I'm going to throw it up on the screen here to share with people. Um, I do have a Proxmox cluster I set up, so I, I am working myself on some updated videos on this. I, I did this even before I did the 45 drives video. And of course, I still have my um, XCPNG one set up. I did learn that if I'm working on some of the fundamentals for how Proxmox works. And one of the, like, it's easy to migrate a VM in Proxmox. So I can have this VM and I can easily migrate it to the other storage in there. But what I've learned is it works a lot different in Proxmox than how that works in XCPNG. And maybe you can answer this question if you know, um, if this host dies, this is, even though it's on shared storage, this gets stuck on here. And I thought that's interesting. Unless you have a full HA, when you only have a two node cluster, it's stuck versus an XCPNG, these are all database driven. So there's a mm -hmm. database that holds all the VMs, which gives you this option. I can say start on, even if one of these hosts goes down, I can start it on the other host to just tell it which host I want to start on, which I thought was, it, it starts to, I started breaking down some of like those fundamental differences. And I think that's, uh, I don't know how much you dove into some of the back end on it. That's kind of what my next thing is to talk about it. Yeah. And I honestly didn't a whole lot, but I think as, as someone mentioned in the chat just a second ago, like effectively speaking, all of these companies that are doing hyper-converged or they're doing shared storage are pushing you to be on a three node. Like even my two node vSAN, vCenter setup that I've got cluster, it's basically just duplicating the data in both locations in case one goes offline. That's how they handle it. And then there's a witness or a, you know, to, to break that quorum. Um, but you know, it's, it's a good question. And like knowing that, that XCPNG is making it available on, on all, or, I'm, I'm assuming that's just the two node configuration though, right? Tom, for the XCPNG that it, it that essentially duplicates the information because they would have to, right? Well, the, see, this is where it's kind of, what goes down to the fundamentals of how they work. And I think I, I have a video where I did this and I made some broad assumptions, but I, uh, when I was talking to people about Proxmox, so then I said, I got to really learn this. Um, I know I always said that I don't know Proxmox very well, but I know XCPNG. XCPNG, um, you always have, the, you, one host always has to be a master and mm -hmm. there's no concept of that because it doesn't need to be, well, unless you're running HA in Proxmox. But even if it's a host of one, that host of one has to be a master. The master holds a database. The database is all the configuration settings, the network settings, all the statuses, the VMs, where those VMs live, where the storage lives the RAM and CPU and all the assignments to those. Then when you add hosts, one or any more hosts you add, get a copy of that database, but they queue mm -hmm. off master. You always talk to master. All changes are sent to master and relayed to all non-master nodes from two to a hundred that you have in this cluster. It makes it interesting and you can re-promote any of them to master, but that's what allows, as long as the VMs on a, a shared storage, any host can die without sure. HA, and you can say, just start it over here or start it over there. Uh, it's not doing anything but moving the memory when you do a migrate, but they're all in sync of the status of that host. It's a it's a different concept versus in, in Proxmox, I've learned everything's under, I think it's like Etsy, PVE. There's, there's, mm. It's all creating your standard Linux style KVM stuff under there. So when you do a migrate, it's just saying, hey, copy from that node that's running over to here, uh, these, and then migrate the memory and cool. Now we got live migration. But the difference becomes if that node goes down, it goes, well, I don't know where that is anymore. The node doesn't right. respond. Uh, I have the shared storage. So you can rebuild a VM and point it at the shared storage and work, but that's not the same as we'll start on the non-failed node. And if you only have a two node system, which I know most time, if you're in production, you're going to have a three node HA or more. Um, so sure. it's going to be different, but it, those little concepts, uh, it's those little nuances I've been learning <laughs> as I go through it. And like you said, this gets really challenging to do all of these. I mean, the amount of work you put in just uh, how many hours do you think you have into your entire video series? I want to let people know we as YouTubers who love to bring you content. Do you know how much time it took us to set all this up? Like I've got two complete labs. I got a people, I got more people working behind me to help set these up too. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was quite the, well, you know, cause I want to do it the best 
I could in, in the right way. So it's really hard to, I think it, I've been asked similarly, how much is it time does it take? I'm like, I, I stopped counting after a while because if I counted, then the, uh, the imbalance would be too great. Like the finished product is, is 20, 25 minutes long, but there's like a solid two weeks of human effort, you yep. know, going into it. Right. And, you know, and it's never just as simple as like, oh, I just spun it up and, and got it going. Like, no, I, I tore it down when I made a mistake and I didn't like that. And that's not following best practices. So go back in, make sure I'm following the best practices. That way, when I do this and giving people the right, the actual correct way, because it's really important to make sure you're not just just going out saying, oh, I think it's like this and it's fine. You know, and yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, these, these sort of things take a long time. Well, funny. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, the reason I learned how products much first better is I started just unplugging stuff in drives and I created all these failure modes because it's not about does it work out of the box. I fully expect all of these hypervisors work out of the box. I want to what happens when I yank a hard Absolutely. drive out because that's what actually happens. Something breaks, something goes down, power loss of one node, so a power supply goes. You got to start simulating the right. failure modes because it's not the success brand new hardware modes that matter. It's how do we recover from a problem because that's what we do as tech people because it's not all sunshine and rainbows out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah if everything were perfectly we wouldn't need to we wouldn't be here right we just set it up and replace it every so many years after it got outdated but yeah the reality is these things just do random things uh so we're i'm, I'm building a series of proxmox clusters and putting some basic workloads on them and just letting them run and letting them run updates uh xcpng is easy for because i'm consulting on it all the time we have tons of and we have this running at our clients so uh what clients have created we have a couple that created i'm like i didn't I would never have thought to use a system that way, but it's not documented to use it that way. That's why we're consulting now because you've broke things in a way that we never <laughs> thought possible. You, someone created like, it, you just know this would be a problem in VMware too. Someone started a snapshot policy and thought it, they wanted to have 24 snapshots attached and go, well, the performance sucks now. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, um, you have to track the differentials between all of these. I will answer a question I've seen in here. Uh, the thing missing for me, us at a company is basically seamless pooling, load balancing, Proxmox seems, uh, not to have this at all. XVG, you somehow still have to choose a host to start the VM on. Actually, there's an entire, they just updated the load balancer in the latest version. There is a load balancing tool you can set up inside of XCPNG. There's actually some load balancing policies that I'm less familiar with, but I know they exist inside of Proxbox. Um, I, they generally in Proxbox, according, this is uh, from the 45 drives people, they actually spoke to this. Um, it does it based on memory. It can start re, shuffling them which makes the most sense because you're more often memory constrained when you are dealing with vms they you're like oh i need too many vms on this particular host there's not enough memory to run them all cpu is a little bit harder to figure out because cpu is not as much as constant it's like right. i need it because someone did a database query so we had this peak where a query and then it sat at idle for the next four hours where it didn't need to do anything uh, but both of them do have functionality for that and i will mention uh i'll share my screen really quick on this I we were diving into this as an Exosan replacement. The Proxmox has Ceph, which is amazing. Uh, the Exosan supports the different distribution types using Linbit. So it's similar to the Erasure coding where you can actually uh, have multiple hosts, lose multiple hosts, have parity between them and uh, stretch it. So this is in, they've updated all their documentation to reflect this, by the way. This is, I'm, I'm looking on the public documentation pages uh, for how their Exosan system uh, works for anyone interested. Um, is that a topic? But the Ceph stuff is really it, it's it's scary. Um, and we talked about this on the Forty Five Drives because they're the Ceph experts. So whenever people say, "Where can I learn about Ceph?" I'm like, "There's a playlist on Forty Five Drives channel." I went through the training <laughs> with them. I was blown away at how amazing Ceph is. Like I understood it in concept, but I did a two day training with the team at Forty Five Drives. And uh, I love Ceph. It's amazing. Also, it's as complicated as you may think it is. <laughs> in terms of Ceph, one of the things that I've heard, because I haven't spent a whole lot of time, like I said, that's my, my next big challenge on my own is uh, to really leverage the quality of Ceph, you need to have a certain amount of like storage targets, right? Nodes, yeah. essentially. It's not just like, you sure, you can do a Ceph of, of two nodes, but isn't it like three or four or five, something like that, that to yeah, really for, get the quality out of it? For a production environment and... The way they at 45 drives sells it, like if you, if you call them up because they will do solutions and we partner with them to build solutions for our clients that are built on stuff. Uh, the 45 drives team was going to say you need a minimum of four servers to build out a solid, 
resilient, yank whatever you want, pull the plug and no one will notice it type of, you know, hyper uh, amazing storage cluster built mm -hmm. out of Ceph. That's if you want it done well. And they still agree to this day. It's hyperconverged is a cool story, but you want to separate your compute and your storage. And the reason why comes down to if you want all four of these servers to replicate that data perfectly. So when I write, I have perfect replicated data across four servers. They call it a public private network inside of Ceph. It's kind of the terminology, but it doesn't mean public private like internet. The mm -hmm. If you have a public network of uh, 10 gig, which is going to attach to your VMware system or your uh, whatever you're using, you know, XCPNG, mm -hmm. Proxmox, et cetera, the private network, you got to amplify that. So you have to have a backend fabric that connects the service together that's going to be at least 25 or 50 gigs. That way, as that write comes across, it's got time to commit because if if I'm could be misquoting this, double check with the 45 drives people, but it it only does synchronized commits. There's no way to let go of that until it's been synchronized across whatever your erasure coding is. So if it says this data must live on two servers, three servers, whatever that is, until it's actually committed, you don't get a commit back. So you can actually have this incredible slowdown of the servers if they don't do it. And because of the way you take a certain number of data drives that may be spinning rust, and then you'll put SSDs uh, to hold the metadata and certain functions of your Ceph cluster. So there's like, hey, here's where the data is. Here's where the here's where the metadata is. Here's where the actual data is. And it's a calculation done. And this calculation is done across all of your Ceph clusters. That's why when you separate it, you have this compute cost of we have to calculate where that data is. We have to calculate the parity for it. This comes us all the way back to what you'd said about Proxmox. And the discussion I think me and you had before about this um, Proxmox did an amazing job, hats off to them for the engineering it took to put it in. And their documentation does tell you to build a more robust network in order to get Ceph working properly. Right. They did not hide anything. They did what you should do. But what you can also do is have a single network interface, go build a cluster on my desk over here, turn Ceph on and tell it to use all of it across one interface. And the moment you actually were to put this in production, you'll notice that if something was a database server uh, doing a bunch of small writes, Ceph is trying to go, let's calculate these writes and hyperconverge it across your storage. Oh, you also want to do the VM itself needs some compute time. No problem. We'll give you some compute time. Something's got to give. <laughs> and right. uh, then you're not, you didn't set up a fast enough network between them. So everything just goes, wait, wait, it's not synced yet. So next thing you know, you watch, you know, your wait times go up and up and up and your thing's going at a crawl. You're like, what happened here? And the 45 drive team has actually shared stories of people who built and broke, well, built what they thought were good production Procmox cluster. And they said, yeah, the queue depth was so small on their consumer drives they used that Ooh. no production workload would actually work on it. The moment you started doing any small writes, the whole system would go high load and just go to an absolute crawl. So there's this good and bad of, yes, they built it in, but you still got to think about it from a big picture design. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense, right? There's, there's always something to be said about making the user experience so easy that it's just a single checkbox and, and magic happens. I mean, that we, we do live in the future, but we don't live there yet. Not for that sort of stuff. Like the, there's, there's always best practice for deploying that stuff. And, and you, you hit on it. Every real big uh, virtualization company that's making gear has these best case or best practices to use when you set up your storage interfaces and your storage network or dedicated SAN if you're you know you're going that route so that you make sure you don't run into IO problems that kill your your performance. Yeah. Uh, and someone commented this. I just want to go back to the documentation. Um the word erasure coding is not used in here. I use the word erasure coding. No, that is not the exact terminology for how ExoSAN works. Uh, they call it disperse six, uh, which is very similar to RAID six. So they have all explained here in their documentation. Uh, erasure coding is not a word used inside of here, but it I said similar to erasure coding. I hope I said it like that um, so people can understand. I'm not, uh, it does have the ability to do things like this, like building a RAID 10 like system with distributed distributed replicated versions of it. I know it's not the same as erasure coding, but it is for people who are, if you're in the Ceph world and I'm trying to make a similar equivalence because you can connect uh, XCPNG to Ceph, but it does not, it's not built in like it is to Proxmox. Proxmox, uh, in hats off to them. Like I said, I'm, I'm really impressed with the work they uh, do on this. Um, but you can set up and uh, by the way, 
Uh, hats off to Proxbox for, uh, for giving me a health warning because of my improper OSD count for setting this up, for not having the proper amount. Uh, I These are single drive systems. This is not in any way ideal. <laughs> 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 and and it, I'm glad it warns me like, hey, you have a health warning here. You you really can't suffer. You used Ceph, but you can't suffer a failure here. And they're not wrong about this. I'm glad they have yeah. a, that is exactly what it should say. So thank you, team at Proxbox for allowing me to set it up with a couple of clicks, but also going, you didn't do it right. <laughs> big warnings. Yeah. yeah, big warnings on there. I'll do this one right here. Um, I use cockpit for virtual machine management, although it's less feature rich compared to Proxmox cockpits, virtual machine modules, all I wanted. Thank you, Grayson, for the donation. And, uh, I'm, there's all kinds of other options, I guess you could say. I've seen people roll their own thing and some people, I, someone told me they don't need a, a whole management interface because they wrote a bunch of stuff in Terraform and Ansible. And then I'm like, hats off to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you have a team that can manage it, but, uh, you made some really good points that you should probably bring up again. One of the things about any of these is cool. Proxmox is Debian based, but you know, we work in the enterprise space. Does everyone uh, who does all these windows management, do they necessarily, are, are they good on the command line out of the box? Every tech is right. <laughs> yeah, no, right. That's honestly, and I imagine when we have this conversation here, I can't wait to see what, what, what the chat says about this, but because guys, I think it's really important that you have a, especially on the console side of things, a means of basic troubleshooting that's not just a command line. I totally understand that if you're using Proxmox, you probably have more Linux uh, staff that is capable of handling it. But like Tom, like you're saying, like the, the company I currently work for right now, we have a, a staff of, of four guys, three guys, and they have varying levels of experience. Some of them are really strong in Linux and some of them are really strong as Windows admins. But every one of those guys is responsible for a P1 call at some point, right? And so... If it ends up being a situation where the the host has lost its its web manageability, then you need to hop onto that con the command line console. Either either you're going to get there via you know an ILO interface or remote access, or you're in person. But if you have to jump online to search for answers how to solve things, you are slowing down your turnaround time, and that doesn't make them bad engineers. It just means that the product doesn't have maybe the level of support and configurability that it should for a, a console but yeah i strong believer that you should have like i love xcpng's console yeah it is amazing and i can't stress more like when i hadn't used it and when i started with xcpng and i i set up my the first server and, and ran i was like i can't believe that vmware didn't steal all of this like all of it it should yeah. have been stolen all of it because it's not new. It's actually, this has been baked in for years. I mean, right. you can go to the, you can go to years and years ago, 10, 15 to the Citrix days and that same console being able to be able to, it just, if I got to reset a network management interface, I don't, I mean, I know in Proxmox, I can go to Etsy slash interfaces. Right. I have a Debian background. I, we have a lot of texts, not all of them could, not every one of them. They are brilliant texts. Some of them are Azure certified. Some are VMware certified. We got a good variety of people there, but not every one of them could also go to SC Network Interfaces and hand type out a new interface or modify something as well. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There may be a couple that would not use Vim very well. <laughs> so <laughs> then uh, Grant Nano's on there, I know. Yeah. But, and it, it's uh, minor because we had a priority, well, it's priority one type of things. Uh, we had a tech today and it, they, we solved it right away, but it was all those, he didn't realize of the way Linux services had to be restarted. Uh, to, so he modified a config and he's like, well, it's still not working. I'm like, just restart the service. He goes, oh yeah, I remember you guys told me that before. You know, we were training him. So it's one mm -hmm. of those things. Not everyone realizes how Linux works. In I get it with Proxmox, but being able to, and when I did my admin video, I, I liked one of the comments. Someone goes, that tab autocomplete is amazing because when you go into and type in like XE for starting the command line in, in there and say VM start and I say VM equals, I can just tab tab and it'll list all the VMs available on there and say, so from the command line, I can start up one of these VMs. Uh, I, I went through a whole that my admin video to kind of show people you could do, you could actually completely manage it for the command line. Maybe not ideal, but there's someone out there that you can bake some scripts together. But sure. honestly, I want to show that it's easy for people who don't spend a lot of time at the command line to run a few commands to get a few of the things that they may run into on a daily basis. A, a host failure that they're not sure why the hosts are out of sync with each other. And there's some simple tools to say resync these hosts or uh, join these hosts back. Or how do you designate a new master when something went wrong and the master didn't flip to another host uh, in your setup? So 
<clears throat> those are being able to just a tab complete. You know, like you don't have to know all the UID people are like UIDs. It's hard. I'm like, no, no, tab auto complete. Just tab tab. It'll spit them all out for you. You can list them all and makes your life a little bit easier. Man, adminning this. Yeah, yeah. I I I still think that it's important that that this, like you're talking about with your your staff like you need to train people for the platforms this is not like throw this at them and say good luck guys you know you don't run a business that way but you also need to make sure that that you're providing the the platform provides the the features and tools that that a variety of people can support you know and that's yeah. that's that's i think there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it and anyone who says if you don't know linux then you shouldn't be using proxmox is doing proxmox in the community disservice because that you want to be inclusive of everybody yeah right and that's that's how you make a better product and in, you know, an easy example is going to be, so one of the client that we were, were bidding on for this large project, um, they're very technical. They're software developers though. They developed a product. They resell their product through a software as a service. It runs in uh, several data centers that they scattered across. They had really nice infrastructure, all with VMware and we're moving to Mac CPNG. But the reality is their day-to-day -day is software development. They're, the, they know how to run the software. They know how to write their software, mm -hmm. um, but they're actually, all their software runs in Windows and it's a really interesting application they put together. But they don't have necessarily, and they don't have to look at VMware. VMware needs some updates. They load some updates. They say yes. It restarts the host, and uh, it shop, it's all HA set up. So it'll you know evacuate them, move the VMs over, things like that. It all does it through the whole vSphere. They're using all the VMware stuff. So they're yeah. evaluating and have decided XCPNG is where they want to go. And the same thing. They're like, cool, we can do this through the web interface. We can hit the patches. It's cool that the command line's there in case of that emergency, but right. uh, ideally, I mean, these are some very skilled uh, developers. They don't want to have to learn Linux because they're not going to use it very often. They're only going to use it if they find a problem. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, and we're on there. And I seen someone ask uh, this question, uh, does XCPNG and Proxmox require more command line troubleshooting than VMware? I don't know that more. Um, there's a, VMware is essentially Linux under the hood as well. It all comes down mm -hmm. to what are you troubleshooting? What went wrong? Uh, right. And what are you, ch what are you chasing down? Um, I've, you know, VMware and XCPNG share a common idea where the hosts themselves are bare. There's is little, the minimal amount running, only what's needed and no more versus Proxmox. This is why Proxmox is super popular in lab. It's a uh, Debian underneath and mm -hmm. it's Proxmox on top of Debian. If you look at the repositories or Debian, so you can apt get your way into a level of hell. <laughs> 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 yes you can i uh, i've seen people and i mean how no one in the corporate world will think about adding a file because here fun fact and don't get me wrong this is cool this is the tom being excited cool i would be horrified if i found a corporate environment using this you can load ceph and then expose your file shares and do samba you can load samba on proxmox and make it your file server alongside your <laughs> vm and you're like that's neat. But also if you had to support a corporate environment, would you, would you enjoy that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, just run your open source windows active directory services on, on your Proxmox host. It'll be fine. Everything's gonna be good. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I mean, we can do some fun things in yeah. some, we can just tie yeah, them together yeah. like that. So, <laughs> uh, is it? Someone says, uh, please don't mix Proxmox with XCBG, XCBG is an absolute winner replacement for VMware, but Proxmox is better for small home office. Neither really has anything to do with cop or pertainer. Oh, uh, I don't know. I, I think the best thing to do in a home lab environment is learn. I, I, if, if I, it's just how I said, I'm horrified. If I see a home, if I see a business environment trying to run Samba next to their, uh, inside their Proxmox, I'm like, well, I don't, this is not great, but a uh, home lab, I mean, I've seen some home labs that are built some amazing house of cards, but it's an amazing learning opportunity uh, yeah. to do it. So hats off to people in the home lab that build some of the most elaborate, like it's Rube Goldberg time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good example. I mean, that's what it's for, right? That's, I mean, you can have a home lab that helps you specifically target being better professionally, right? Which a lot of people, I know, I know a lot of people who are into home labs are doing so because when they go to work, they need to make sure that they know what they're doing and they can't play at work on production system and then there's people who are just masters of self-hosters and they built the like you said these massive house of cards on top of systems that you know they're kludging through because they're just trying to have fun and get better at it so that's that's the magic of it go for it right take your yeah. proxmox and, and go to, to the moon with that just do it 
<laughs> I, I actually uh wendell from level one text he calls it the forbidden router i believe it's the title of the video and it just talks about virtualizing uh your routing platforms like pf sense and things like that it's a fun deep dive once again do i want to see this in corporate no but you get to learn a lot virtualizing it you start mm -hmm. to understand how the packets come through uh, you, you go oh, okay this is how it happens when you virtualize network adapters this is what q and q means oh wait there's overhead wait i had to change the mtu these are all those things you start to understand better because you took that endeavor of diving into it. So I always encourage people to do these things. I just don't encourage them to install them as a production system. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so follow your best practices, learn how to do it, and then follow the best practices, people. Yeah. Um, does Proxmox allow thin provisioning and iSCSI? Hopefully, XCPNG closes next release. To my knowledge, neither Proxmox nor XCPNG support thin provisioning uh, for iSCSI. I, I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah, that's, that's my knowledge as well. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, someone had, I remember seeing a write-up of why open source ones don't do thin provisioning and ice. Cause I, I, if I could find that, uh, someone was uh, on Reddit had a really, they clearly had done their homework and I uh, really talked about the history of it and why there were some challenges in making that happen. Um, I, I don't remember what the reasons were, but there's some just technical challenges and the answer, my answer is generally use NFS, but the people using or asking for it and I got use often because especially I've run uh, one of my home lab friends I chat with on Twitter. I can't remember. He's got some older uh, proprietary hardware, but it's really nice. He got it out of, um, you know, his corporate environment, but it only mm -hmm. presents iSCSI. It's a really fast, all like Santa Ray he's got, but he goes, it only presents iSCSI. And it's kind of a hang up for me because he goes, I, I don't, and he says, I could replace it. It's expensive and it works really well. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, I get it. <laughs> Uh, what else did we have for questions here? Uh, oh, yeah. iSCSI does not ever do thin provisioning. Drive has to be formatted by a host. I, I want to say someone had a write-up on how to build LVM thin provisioned inside of Proxmox. Proxmox has got some weird things you can do, but um, uh, I don't know that they're like the book way to do it. <laughs> yeah. I, that's probably, I and mean, that's the nice thing about Linux in general, right? There's a lot of ways to, to slice it up. You could probably do a out of band mounting of shares. And then when you, they're presented to the, the operating system as, you know, like you said, an LVM, and then you can thin provision on inside of that, but it's technically being backed by something external. But yeah, that doesn't feel like the, the good way to do it. But yeah, you know, with like VMware, that sort of stuff, they, they've got all their VAAI and all that sort of like connectivity and integrations with all the storage vendors. So all the iSCSI stuff and, and I'm pretty sure Tom, I can do thin provision. I, I have to double check. Yeah, where does it? yeah. I think I can provision an NFS as well. I can print thin provision all day yeah. long everywhere. So that sounds more like a driver issue than it, you know, they're, they're set up than, than a technical issue, but. Yeah, well, it's one of those. It's always just some weird thing. Maybe I, I, I can't remember. I know maybe it wasn't this, but maybe it is this. But I don't remember this being in a writer. But maybe there's some proprietary. There's a license on a few thin provision, and, or somebody has a patent on thin provisioning ice because he. Who knows? <laughs> that would be someone. Someone's got to make their money before you can get that yeah. feature. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the answer really is use NFS, which is thin provision. Um, and I, I should do some testing on this to validate how this works exactly. But essentially, uh, TrueNAS can thin provision a ZVAL. It mm -hmm. will be called thick provision, but it's thin provision because of the compression and everything of the way it works in ZFS. Um, I believe you don't have to claim as much space. It will show the space so you can right. put these larger amounts, which the big challenge you run into when something isn't thin provisioned in a hypervisor is when you have to do snapshots. Each snapshot is going to take the size. If you have 60 gigs, it's going to say, even if that snapshot is only using a differential of like one gig of change, it's going to need 60 gigs again. And you go do a couple more snapshots. Next thing you know, you're like, wait a minute, this VM, this particular VM and its snapshots take up this large amount of the ice cuzzy. Top that off when you start deleting them, you need at least as much space available to coalesce them back into uh, their yeah. nature and the inability to coalesce is something we run into where people set it up iSCSI or use some type of, you know, iSCSI only device. They snapshot too many times. They tried to leave them like, yeah, it doesn't have enough space to coalesce. I'm like, yeah, you're going to, we got to figure this one out. We're going to have to like back this VM up and restore it without the <laughs> with snapshots. Like there's not a, not an easy solution for that. You've, you've done something off book again. <laughs> every, every virtual admin, uh, has at least once had their their snapshots consume all of their physical storage 
and, and crashed a virtual machine. If you haven't done that, I mean, are you even into yeah. virtualization? I mean, that's someone makes a snap, says, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll destroy this snap in a, in a, in the day after I make sure that my my modifications worked," and then they forget and it's a database server, and you know, it's it's now down. Everything's down. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, it, it's one of those unexpected things because what happens is the snapshots, if they can't coalesce and you have a job that runs on a regular schedule and we have a client, like anytime I see the ticket comes in, I, I don't have to read the client name. I know by the problem they created because I don't know why they, we've talked to them a couple of times about this. They think snapshots are great ideas for backups um, yeah. because they're snapshots always messing with things. Great. And then they set them on a schedule to do something like, oh, we're going to have a snapshot like every 10 minutes. And uh, then the way the system does, it waits for, a free time to coalesce them back on there. And if you are under high demand, there's not a lot of free time. So if the IO load is too high on that particular NFS mount, it won't coalesce right away. And then it has more to coalesce and more IO time and more to coalesce things. You know, it's like, yeah, there's 37 snapshots on this one VM and now the system's not working again. I'm like, I know which client that is. They did it again. <laughs> yeah, Jeez. they forgot. They said a, they said a job that says snapshot every saw. So yeah, this is where we're at now. <laughs> Sounds like they're confusing storage snapshots and virtual machine snapshots, right? Yes, yes. They, uh, it's, it's that's the that's the fun part about consulting uh, for some of these people. They they come up with ideas I I would have never had. So we've actually learned how to troubleshoot scenarios that I didn't <laughs> ever think to create in my lab. <laughs> You're like, why would I do that? But now I get to figure out how to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's see. Seems there's any other questions in there. Uh, is Nutanix any good? We answered this at the very beginning. Um, Nutanix is a, this black box of their own hyper-converged solution that doesn't support iSCSI, uh, doesn't support, well, doesn't support external storage. We'll just say it doesn't support right. CANs uh, and doesn't have any pass-through. So if that is, if you want a company, are, are, will we call them the Apple of it? Like it's, it's the hood's locked, we're not opening the hood. You get what you get. You can only twiddle these couple knobs and you pay us a lot of money. It's, it it's works. funny. Yeah. I mean, except for the setting up of it. So the one thing that I, I we didn't get to talk about with, with Nutanix in terms of like the configuration of it, I find it the strangest out of all of the systems, including XCPNG. In fact, that, that, uh, that the, um, the virtual machine management is done in another, you know, a VM, right. That when you do a Nutanix deploy, you get one ISO, you install it because they have a community edition and you can install it and it'll work on a single host. That's what I was using. You can install that, that AHV hypervisor and then you wait. And in the background, the elves are deploying a separate virtual machine, the CVM that is where everything happens. So unlike, uh, I mean, it's, it's similar to XCPG in the sense that the, the Zen is just doing virtualization options, but you don't interact with the AHV hypervisor at all. Zen, you know, you or XCPG, when you get on the console, you can you can essentially do all the things you need to do by the console. With AHV, it's like, no, everything that happens here happens in their hypervisor or they're in the CVM, the controller virtual machine. And it was a a a, a departure for one I'm familiar with. The other thing that is kind of baked into it that is weird is that the amount of overhead that takes to run the CVM and all the hyper-converged functionality is very high like minimum of 16 gigs has to be assigned to that that cvm and without a cvm you have no nutanix so it is uh there's a commitment involved there i think that a lot of people will not see that works beneficially for a home lab necessarily but you know it uh it's 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 an interesting approach i love their gui though their gui is it's beautiful that's it's the, just, i hands it's off so that. pretty Watch yeah. Richard's video on Nutanix. I mean, if, if nothing else, it's pretty. So <laughs> it, it, it exactly it is pretty. It's it's got nice HTML5 animations and there's a built-in like game you can play on it, which is interesting. But oh yeah, it's got 2048 built in the top yeah, corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, just just I find that just fascinating. You don't see that anywhere. Um, maybe they just have a little extra time on their hands. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cute, but it's nice. Um I don't know. I, I thought I did think that was a nice feature on there. And any of these UIs can always, they're often written by technical people. So they don't always get the mm -hmm. polish or the flashiness that you may see, um, which is a shame. I, I, I like though, when I, the new XO light just got updated again today, I think, or yesterday, um, which is their light interface for XCPG. I'm, I'm, I won't do a video on it until it's a little bit, it's very rough right now, but what's not rough about it is XO light and when they come out with XO6 are going to be 
um, using that new dark mode interface that looks really nice. They, they actually hired a dedicated, they've got, Vates has gotten to be pretty big as a company, the people behind XO and XCPNG. They have a dedicated designer who's really pushing this forward from a very, they're doing it slowly, but it's pushing forward with a whole design philosophy. They've already set out, you actually uh, can, they've got it all on their GitHub. You can see all the colors they chose, how they're going to label menus, how they have all the elements. Like they put this whole philosophy of design and now they're, pulling from it so when the, the the technical people writing it they have elements like this is the applied element that works so this is how you have to fit it on the screen within these design parameters which is kind of cool because this is one of those things that often get built as the haphazard design of technical people <laughs> we right. don't necessarily think in art space but when an artist applies rules and says here's your design elements and how you're going to follow them. these are the color schemes one makes it easier for technical people because we just have to write the menus that come up and someone else designed the color scheme for those type of menus and those modal windows and everything else uh, on down, which I think is kind of cool. I super happy to hear that too, because that's the right way to do it, right? There's, I understand that, like you said, we're technical people. We think about the, the UI necessarily maybe as the, the last step after all the hard work has been done. Like, let's just, let's just throw something out to get it done. But like, there's studies, right? There's people who go to college, uh, for years and study in how to design and build out user experiences and then make them standardized across all of the products. And VMware did that a long time ago too. Yeah. Right? I mean, you you log into ESXi and you get the ESXi console, you go look at vCenter, they share the same component tree and that kind of stuff, right? There's like, that's that's what a business who's serious about their product does. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, it, it's a big lift on the back end because you have to hire a dedicated resource whose mm -hmm. job is just to make things look pretty. When you think about that from a business standpoint, you're like, that person's not going to be cheap. Uh, they are going to set the cadence for how this is done uh, and keep them up to date. But in the end, what that looks like long term, if you've got the vision for how you want your product to look, it's so much more <laughs> wonderful user experience when I go, right. I can expect the same similar elements across this product line. Thank you. So I'm not searching for it. And I will say uh, good UI design is it makes the job easier, especially when I have to teach people. Oh, no, it's there's like the sub menu, sub menu. Oh, oh you got this far and it collapsed and I had to go start over again. Please don't do that. <laughs> yeah, I right click over here and I got a context menu, but if I right click over here, I get the browser menu. That's a, that's my my complaint about Proxmox. So there's context menus in some places, but not others. And yeah, I mean, that's that's how you do it. And then you have that design language and then when someone learns that interface, they can follow through that product. And if you think about it, if I, if I put on like my sitting in a conference room, listening to the sales guy, demonstrate the product, right? Show you the interface. That's a first impression. First impressions are really important. If you're looking at something and it looks amazing, you're like, okay, I'm more interested in seeing what this has got behind the scenes versus going, I'm going to focus on the fact that that looks like it came from 2015. You know? Yes. Yes. And I, I've heard the complaints and I get you. There's, uh, <laughs> I will say, I think, I can't remember if it was one of the people in my office. I think they call it the Fisher price interface. They're not a big fan of the XO interface. <laughs> They're like, oh, really? this, this is like a Fisher price interface. My kids might use or something like that. I, just, I laughed. I'm like, fair enough. They go, they got a, yeah. come with a box of crayons. You know, I, I I'll take the ribbing. <laughs> I'll take the, I'll take them jokes. <laughs> Do we know? know when um the new uh xcpg interfaces are going to become uh, this year is their plan uh as far as i know they they haven't you know it was like developers do they don't set hard dates on there the good sure. news is from a design philosophy they 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 plan to really make it so you'll be able to switch back and forth between them so you'll actually have um, one of the updates whenever that update comes that starts bringing us to new elements they're not going to say here it is it's going to be okay. here's an option to switch to it Here's always an option to switch back in case you have a problem. So they're That's actually going to keep them dual. Then there comes a point where the old interface becomes essentially static in terms of it's not getting any of the new features uh, because the other one becomes feature complete. But for those of you that they're, they're, they want to do like a, a really good transition. Um, so they put a plan together to do that as well, which I think is actually uh, pretty cool on there. Um, any chance to revisit Harvester? Ah. I I felt Harvester not to be the most complete system. I don't think I don't look at it as a competitor in this space, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know. I've it's exclusively home lab people asking me about it, but I don't know what it offers in terms of features. Have you looked at Harvester at all or only in the context of running um containers, right? Specifically. And, yeah. And you know, I, I still kind of subscribe to the well you can virtualize via you, know, you can virtualize a linux box and run your containers on that versus having harvester be the platform so i haven't i haven't dug into it but like you i'm i'm hearing a lot about people asking about it as well 
Yeah, it just didn't feel as complete. Uh, but I think Tim, Techno Tim, another friend of ours, I think he's got a video on it. I should probably revisit on there. Um, I, I don't know. It's uh, I, I think it doesn't compare in features to the ones we've kind of mentioned before, but hey, maybe it's worth looking at. I mean, it's always uh, one more thing to play with. Um, in an XCPG pool, can I add a machine that has a different network card? Y yes, but... Yes, but you can have mismatched network cards. It's less than ideal. You just have to remap them so they're applied to the same network. So every machine in the right. pool, ETH0 needs to be plugged into that same network across all of them. It can be a 1 gig, it can be a 10 gig, but as long as ETH0, ETH1, so on and so forth, are all plugged into the same network, it can work. Uh, I've got mismatched ones in a pool right now for my lab we have a few clients because they had some older machines and we wanted them in a pool uh sometimes because you can move vms even when they're not in the pool uh, you can actually just build them separately this one of the things that i wish was cool about xcpng and this goes back to the Citrix days you can take two separate systems not in the same pool and migrate vms between them uh so they don't have to be part of the same resource pool to do it. So the first question is, do you need a resource pool between these two? If you don't need it and one system is particularly different, then you can do that. Of okay. note, if I have five nodes and four of them are modern processor, one node is not modern processor. Maybe it's a few generations older. Uh, pools go down to the lowest common denominator. So the dumbest one in a pool makes... The other one's just as dumb. <laughs> just, just, this is the best way to describe it. But the moment you kick the dumb one out, uh, all of them auto upgrade to full features. Because if, if there's certain uh, features that aren't available, it makes them not available for the whole pool, which is a good reason often not to have one old machine in there. Doesn't mean you can't also be talking to it, but it's one of those things that uh, it may not be the best ideal. We're going to go a few more minutes here and take maybe the last few questions. Um, but yeah, it was almost uh, peaked up close to 400 people on here. So that's that's amazing. So a lot I'm of people so want that... popular topic here. <laughs> it, it is. It's It's a big topic for a lot of people. Yeah, it sounded like 350. It was like 379, 380, and it kind of, I, I watch them uh, peak and go, but <laughs> that's really cool. Um, what is the best approach to moving uh, a large enterprise from VMware to XB when you have a learning curve for current staff I'm testing now? Um, yeah, one nice thing, and something Rich said, and I'll let him comment more on this as well. Uh, when you're moving people across like that, it, because of, I think there's, once you tell people, Part of the training we're going to offer for this company that's we're moving almost between five and 600 VMs for, they don't want, well, they would love it if we would move all the VMs, but actually what they want us to do is train them how to move the VMs, train them on the system, and then be there as a support plan. So it's usually hiring a third party uh, to do it, unless you want to designate someone going, your task is to become as knowledgeable about XCPNG as Tom is right now. Go watch his videos or go watch some redacted. You know, it all depends on different company, but companies aren't always willing to dedicate a resource uh, to that level of training. So they usually hire a third party consultant to come in, teach them, fill in the gaps, give them the overview and kind of be there as a backstop while they do the transition um, and learn. I mean, how you guys, because in your corporate job, you're making some change as well. I mean, it's probably how you guys would handle it. Yeah, it's it. I think it really depends on on the company's workload, the type of people they have staff, right? Like some companies, like you mentioned with software engineers, they don't necessarily want to be that intimately part of that. But if you have an engineering staff, like basically you would write seed ride through some of it. And either you get to the point where you feel comfortable doing the rest of these yourself, or they are there to, and, and you have them as a backup to assist you, or you let them finish the job and they give you run books afterwards that people can use then to, to follow any sort of necessary things that they didn't pick up as part of the process. But I think that in a, in a good department with, with that has the actual staff for it, you have people who really love this stuff anyway and so they're going to be there watching and trying to insert themselves so that they can take over but you know it, it depends on it's always dependent on the org right and who they got for their their staffing yeah that it kind of comes down to that um this is just a quick one uh for years uh Cal, here's a donation for the next barbecue so thank you very much i much appreciate it thank you mark <laughs> barbecue sounds good it's almost summer here uh let's see uh, and i i agree like harvester's cool via management system uh and it's more of a technology demo proving that Kubernetes can manage VMs, nothing like XCPNG. I there's a love hate I have with Kubernetes. Like I know people that work it. I Swift on security has one of my favorite tweets. Someone asked me what Kubernetes is. I tried teaching them. Now neither one of us know what Kubernetes is. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. And I'm like, yeah, that's the way. That's 
it's a beautiful system when it works, but uh, read the Reddit debrief why Reddit went down last year with a Kubernetes update. And it comes down to too long didn't read Kubernetes is hard, even for people who do it for a living. Uh, it's it's beautiful when it works, but it's also a fairly complicated system. And it comes crashing as, as much as it's a self-healing, amazing, we're just going to build all these servers and they're going to self-heal and we're going to spin them up and it's elastic. Also, when it goes wrong, it goes completely wrong. Um, yeah. If you listen to the cloud, I think it's called the Cloud Security Podcast. They recently had on a Google engineer because um, Google runs a lot of Kubernetes, but they talked about the level of engineering it takes just to understand your logs of what goes wrong in Kubernetes. It's Ooh. it's a long podcast. It's really insightful of how they have to decipher things, but you're also like, wow, that is, there's, as much as there's tooling to make it work, this person's a security engineer who has to find out when it doesn't work. And even uh, they talked about how they found when someone hacks your Kubernetes, it's so hard to unwind that because you're like, it's whack-a-mole. Oh, shut down the server. It's infected. Now that one's infected. It's, it's, over it, there. it's spawning them everywhere. And he walked through the process of how to unwind uh, hidden stuff in Kubernetes that people put in there to inject. It was, it was a wonderful podcast. It's called the Cloud Security Podcast. Uh, and it's about things like Kubernetes and Google. And it's like, your mind's kind of blown. You're like, wow, that's okay. There's there's what we talk about here in, in, in the home lab. Then there's some engineering jobs that me and uh, Rich do because we work in the corporate world. But then there's Google, <laughs> the hyperscaler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. In, uh, we don't play in that space. They're they're way above. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kubernetes, I, they need Kubernetes to operate how they operate. But wow, there's uh, mm -hmm. when you start thinking about the complexity of it bringing down, I don't know that I'd want to fix a broken Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> it's above my pay grade, we'll just say, because I don't do it for a living. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, is any other questions you see? Um, there was one question about backup that just popped up there from Elman from all the solutions, which do you think has the best backup features? But I'm going to say XCPNG's backup system is extremely complete because they have, but you got to remember Proxmox backup is its own product. It's a separate product. So it's hard to compare as far as like natively integrated. XCPNG did a good job because it comes with XCPNG Proxmox backup. I don't know if you've ever used it. I, not many videos on it. I know there's, there's a lot of people say they like it, but I, I haven't touched it. Yeah. I haven't really touched it either. Uh, I think Jay from learn likes TV is well. the, he's got a video, but it's an older video because they've got a new version out. So I don't know how, how much has changed since he did that video like two or three years ago. Um, so I don't have enough direct experience to really dive into it. It's uh, mm -hmm. it, I've heard people say they like it, but like CPNG, I can speak from experience. Uh, I do know they have a feature that is not in Proxmox at this time is uh, they not only can back up your VMs, you can build it so you can point it at that same backup repository and restore it to a whole other environment as a test validation with automation. So that's how their backups aren't just like we got deltas and replications. They have all the cool, you know, usual things you expect from a backup. That's just table stakes at this point. But they can do backup validation and have it restore on a completely separate environment. So you can say, hey, uh, automate all this test restore and send me a notice. Will all these VMs? restore because nobody wants a, a a backup works everyone wants a restore that works so you have to validate mm -hmm. your restores and they have an entire validation system built in that to me is like that's it this is the same thing you expect and you have this with veeam and uh your commercial mm -hmm. tools they come with validation uh doing the restores datto before the Kaseya incident was a popular company and uh one of the things datto had was this kind of cool you could uh, their backups used to restore and send you a screenshot i think there's a few other applications that do this they'll send you a mm -hmm. screenshot out of your booted VM and uh, send it in an email to say, yeah, we validated it. They used to validate it in their cloud. Uh, so you knew you could do the restore. So it's kind of, there's, I wouldn't say the backups are really, really good in XCPNG. Yeah, the one thing I wanted to mention to you and to any of the viewers, because I saw someone bring up Veeam, uh, actually had a conversation with a Veeam engineer and uh, who shall na be named nameless. And he said that they were so close to releasing their X or their Proxmox uh, backup agent for Veeam. And I, I pressed them on the XCPNG because like, okay, cool, great. But what about XCPNG? And the guy said, um, unofficially, they are aggressively working towards coming up with a mechanism that will work with XCPNG, but there's no no release time for it. So there's that company is working on something. Hopefully it, it comes out and it's it uh, helps people who are migrating from VMware um, or you know whatever, because that's what Veeam really wants to provide is a ubiquitous platform for 
cross back up and restore across anything that they can target. So that was interesting to see. And he also said to me that his final note was like, they don't listen to us. They don't listen to the engineers and what the engineers say. They listen to the, the forums, the people in the forums. So if anyone out there, and this is just a note, anyone who's thinking about XCPNG, who's in the VMware world using Veeam and really wants to keep that, that, uh, that long pole in the tent in their virtualization, get into the Veeam forums and start telling them where you're going and what you want, because those people are apparently listening. And no, I don't yeah. work for Veeam, so don't ask me. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's go a little bit um, further on this because this just happened um, the other day. This happened on March 25th. Oh, uh, look at that. Oliver Lambert has said he'll dedicate resources to work with the team at Veeam. Um, I will throw this in there. It's not hard to find. It's in the, it's in the XCPNG blog post, but there's obviously... There's some discussion going on here. Um, they're willing to work together on this. And That's he's good. thrown the gauntlet down that he's willing to. Oliver, the team at Vates, is willing to work with Veeam. Veeam has got people replying. Um, so, yeah, there's uh, – oh, and here's a fun one here. The uh, SN, the new version, the new API for the storage, yeah, right here uh, from – this is yesterday that this was posted. Um, look for a blog post next week as an announcement on that. So that's great. But yeah, uh, follow this for, I'll throw it in. I'll throw a link into the uh, chat for people that just want to jump right over there. But yeah, we, we use Veeam at uh, the company. I'm wearing a shirt actually for people that might want to laugh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, a great shirt. Yeah. Yeah. We, 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 we may, I may make a version of this shirt that we'll throw available out in my store at some point, but um at CNWR, we're we're a Veeam certified. I forget this. I don't know the Veeam cert because I'm not Veeam certified. I'm not the person to ask, but we have numerous technical people on our team. Sure. Uh, we're a Veeam certified cloud storage writer. We have our uh, we have a whole Veeam storage repository in our data center. So we've got we use a lot of Veeam. We'll just say that we 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 pay a lot of money to that company um, with licenses and things like that. But um, so yeah, we're interested in this too. It's been a hiccup because you want one dashboard to be able to manage your backups and it does create some challenges uh for someone who's doing what we do and what i say when i say we uh, i mean cnwr we manage uh, we have over like 100 businesses we manage and some percentage of those are using hypervisors and we need to be able to back things up and i seen someone had a question about like what's a good application aware backup well once it goes down to application aware veeam is that cheap, but also known really good for their <laughs> ability to do the full application where backup. That's why we um, use it. This is one of the things I've been mean, backing up the VMs and creating restores from, from the XO backup. Hey, it works great and everything else, but mm -hmm. uh, hey, uh, we have some companies running some unique databases. I, I can't try either a, I got to shut the entire VM down to back it up. I cannot right. trust data in flight. I need application aware. Um, once you've tried to restore some of these databases from a, snapshot where things may or may not be in a fully committed state. Yeah, that's a, it's like, cool, the VM's back, but the database doesn't start because X, Y, Z or the transactions yeah. are messed up and now it doesn't work. So you need application where backup, I get the need for Beam. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, I think that's the big thing is transaction logging, especially if you run a SQL, right? That's being able to go in and say, quies, we're going to go ahead and, and start your backups. That's, that's really, that's, that's really what's that. And I, and I also think that it's, it's a, Having the ability to run XCPG at home and be able to back up your stuff for free is fantastic. Right now, oh, yeah. I'm backing up my VMware stuff, but I had to spend like eight thousand dollars on a Synology. So, I mean, it's it's a sunk cost. It was only eight thousand dollars. I don't run Veeam at home, but like you get that functionality built in and it's solid. That's that's fantastic. And I guess the same thing for Proxbox and, and uh, PBS Proxbox backup server, right? Is but it, it you have those solutions, get it. You don't get that with VMware. I'm never going to get that with VMware. Nope. No, and one of the nice things is when we sell like XCPG to a client who we're not managing your backups, they're managing their own backups, their own environment, uh, because there's no multi-tenancy concept for backups inside of XCPG. But when you're a managed mm -hmm. service provider, you kind of need the multi-tenancy dashboard. Um, I can't just put everyone's backups in one giant pile. Right. That would not, there, there are some different challenges that come with that. We actually would have to build out a system for it and a way to monitor that system. Um, not that we can't tool it. There's labor costs involved in tooling it. Veeam provides that for us with a multi-tenant dashboard. Uh, everyone's segmented. One of the concepts you have to really think about is if someone infected a backup for one customer, how do you stop that from propagating to others? Veeam has mm -hmm. methods by which this works. Uh, not all backup companies are made the same. Um, that may be a fun topic of ways you can pivot off of backups because this has happened before where 
there's a common key that a managed service provider might use to set up all the backups of their clients. But it turns mm -hmm. out that same key gets you into the backups and can pivot through all the clients. And uh, yeah, there's some backup companies. We actually, I, I, I have a list. I ones I ruled out years ago. I have, I won't call them out yet because I don't know if they've ever fixed it, but we actually told them the reason we couldn't use their backup service is because of the common key problem. I said, we found a way to extract your key out of a single client. They're like, yeah, that's how it works. And I'm like, no, you need to build a new key. Well, that would require a whole other retooling of ours. I'm like, yeah, but if I can get a key out of one client and I'm a threat actor and I pivot, now I can go into those backups to start deleting them for other clients or extracting mm -hmm. the data, which is a terrible idea. So <laughs> yeah. I don't want to get too off topic on that. We're, we're going to wind this down here. We could, we could go <laughs> on and on. Uh, yeah. The longer you work in enterprise, the more you start really having to think about this stuff. Um, mm. There's so many attacks on all these things we have to make it all secure it's it's an ever-ending battle <laughs> absolutely any final words you have for the audience here rich uh not really i think that uh one thing i'll say is that i i thought i was done with the series and i am officially but i'm i'm being asked to make a a roundup so i think that in terms of the the the, the four that i've made there'll be a fifth even though i said there wasn't going to be a fifth and and try to compile a big list so if you want to get the tldr from the stuff i did just watch that one when it comes out <laughs> yeah if you don't but want to watch all the other ones it. he did like i said yeah. they're linked down below in the description uh subscribe to two guys tech i got his previous videos on this he's got other videos too by the way he's not just the virtualization guy <laughs> there's actually a lot of great <laughs> thank stuff you on there. <laughs> thank you i appreciate that <laughs> yeah there's a lot of great content on rich's channel uh so like and subscribe over there uh, check all that out. Look for his uh, new video that he'll be doing. It'll be the roundup, which good news is he doesn't have to rebuild all the servers. Uh, what we, we love reusing content, but it's going to grab all the B-roll you had. <laughs> I kept it all just for this. Yeah. Haven't, yeah. haven't purged it out yet. <laughs> yeah, man. That's, that's storage topics. See, the reason YouTubers, especially as tech ones, love talking about storage is because we have to store all that B-roll we created and everything mm -hmm. else. So <laughs> yeah, it's a, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I kind of laugh because what did Linus say? Because Linus has that new storage video. And mm -hmm. like no matter what server he builds because of the scale you start operating at when you're at Linus Tech Tips size, it's always, we built a new, as he called it, Hunak, I think, storage server. And we hate it <laughs> just <laughs> because it doesn't do all the magic or we hate it because it's too expensive. Yeah, it's the fun the fun topics around that. But thanks, everyone, for joining. Thanks for all of you uh, coming to this topic. As I said, Terrorist Channel, watch the next series he's going to do. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. All right, thanks. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everybody.